So uh, we're now going to turn to uh, the questions in uh, systemic therapy realm. Uh, so I'll ask uh, my colleague, Dr. Beer, what is the optimal chemotherapy regimen? And specifically, uh, the, the, this question on the table now of, of standard dose paclitaxel versus the so-called dose dense or weekly paclitaxel. Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's an important question, and I think the short answer to this is there are um, multiple uh, potential um, usable chemotherapeutic approaches. And that was, in fact, the, the conclusion from the consensus conference several years ago. But what's that based upon? Well, the standard um, uh, chemotherapy for this disease um, established um, a number of years ago through GOG-111 and GOG-158 was um, IV car um, carbotaxel on a Q3 weekly basis. Um, and that's level one evidence. We know how to give it. It's effective. Um, the JGOG, the Japanese GOG, um, conducted a uh, um, randomized phase three trial comparing dose dense to uh, the Q3 weekly uh, regimen, showing a very impressive survival advantage for the dose dense regimen. There was criticism uh, of that study in that it was a small study, and one of the big concerns was that it was in um, an ethnically uh, different population. There was concerns about neuropathy and myelosuppression, perhaps in the uh, U.S. population. Since that time, the uh, G, um, GOG 262 was conducted. It's been reported at ASCO, um, which effectively shows that weekly can be given without a lot of toxicity. There is some additional toxicity, but but not, uh, not that much. It's acceptable. It's hard to interpret that study in that bevacizumab was in both arms. Um, and what they showed, interestingly, was that the uh, advantage to the dose dense arm uh, was not evident, perhaps suggesting that bevacizumab uh, with his anti-antigenic effects neutralizes the advantage of weekly uh, Taxol. Um, we certainly can't leave the upfront therapy um, discussion without at least mentioning, we'll probably come back to it later on, that certain uh, patients um, would benefit or could benefit from interperineal therapy, which is also an acceptable upfront therapy. Uh, most of us feel that those are patients who are optimally debulked. Um, and there's three randomized studies that have shown a survival advantage to patients who receive interperineal therapy compared to IV therapy. And so I, I would say that um, all of the above is an answer to this, which is that depending on your patient, um, any one of those three choices would be reasonable. I personally, um, probably from a historic perspective, since I trained at the NCI, uh, still primarily give Q3 weekly Taxol, and I don't give those dance. <laughs> Uh, one, one, uh, I think that uh, the GOG-262 actually gives us a little more information. It's not definitive information because it looks at subsets. But uh, the subset analyses in that study were very interesting. Uh, comparing uh, weekly taxol to every three-week taxol in combination with every three-week carboplatin. Uh, what the study showed in the 15% of patients who elected not to take bevacizumab was a major advantage for the weekly taxol. But in the 85% who did take bevacizumab, there was no difference. Uh, so that in essence, I think uh, what one is looking at is that if one decides to use bevacizumab in combination with taxol carboplatin uh, for uh, all intravenous for uh, ovarian cancer, uh, that one does not have to go to the inconvenience for the patient of having them come back weekly for taxol. But if one is not going to use bevacizumab, there is uh, evidence to suggest that the weekly taxol may offer a significant advantage. And, and that may be, the answer to that question may be that weekly taxol is acting as an anti-angenic agent. That's exactly right. I think that's, I think that's, but it's supposition, but I think yeah, that's, that's exactly right. right. Yeah. yeah. So any, uh, any uh, comments on the, and we're going to talk uh, in a moment about the uh, bevacizumab question, but any comments about following up Mike's and Tate's comments about sort of primary therapy. Do you guys have any thoughts about interchangeably using docetaxel instead of paclitaxel? I think uh, the Scottish study years ago showed that tax taxotere or docetaxel carboplatin uh, and paclitaxel carboplatin are essentially equivalent in terms of efficacy uh, er er with every three regimens. Uh, that study though, and, and people have ignored this, and I don't understand why, showed that every toxicity that was assessed occurred more frequently with docetaxel carboplatin with the exception of neuropathy. And in the case of neuropathy, the incidence of grade three, four neuropathy was single digits in both arms, 8% in the taxol carboplatin arm and 2% in the docetaxel carboplatin arm, so slightly less. 
in the docetaxel carboplatin arm. So I think when making a decision about which taxane to use, you have to take all that into account. But I think docetaxel carboplatin is a reasonably acceptable regimen. Yeah. You're trading off toxicity, I think, and it's somewhat expensive, but uh, I think it's acceptable. And I'd just like to revisit a little bit what Tate said, it because I think um, it's an interesting analysis and we should, we should just, for the practicing uh, physician, point out that, uh, as Tate said, that, that the 262 analysis is a subset analysis. It's a very small number of patients, and so I would not consider that level one evidence, but it is, it is supportive of the um, Japanese study. The only thing, just uh, the docetaxel question, I think the, uh, certainly uh, marrow suppression was, was greater docetaxel, but, and, but you certainly can consider a patient who, let's say, is a diabetic and already has pre-existing diabetic neuropathy, um, and, and you want to give a taxane, that may be less neurotoxic. I mean, it's a specific situation, but that might be one where you consider that. So, so can I just throw out one or two?